Michigan won. They're winning for now. The template matters. The template matters. You should be tired of me saying this by now. But the template matters. If you are baking Christmas cookies that you want to come out looking like Christmas trees, but if your cookie pan is shaped like Frosty the Snowman, I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how many small groups you attend. You can come here to the 9 and the 11. You can sit on the front row. You can lift your hands. Your cookies are going to come out looking like Frosty. And that probably means you can't cook either, and they probably don't even taste good. <laughs> don't gift me. The template matters, and I submit that businesses, schools, and oh yeah, even churches use the wrong template. For we employ the leadership template. Bookstores are replete with books regarding what? Leadership. You've got course after course that offers classes on what? Leadership. Yet, year after year after year after year after year, we have so many leaders, prominent leaders that fall. What, what do we do? We gossip about them rather than analyze and ask, are they, are they bad people or were they poured into a bad template, making failure inevitable? I'm afraid we've made the leadership template analogous with success. I submit that the leadership template is a bad template. So, have a good week. <laughs> What's the right template? The fellowship template. The fellowship template. The linkship template where we link to the real leader. How many times does King James use the word leader? Y'all should know it. Okay, you don't. Six times. Six times. Three of those times it's not used favorably. When he says stuff like, how can the blind lead the blind? Not used favorably. Yet it uses the word servant 493 times. Think he's trying to tell us something? But what comes to mind when you hear the word servant as you juxtapose it with leader? Would you rather be called servant a leader? And don't give me a church answer. So one of the reasons for this series that's coming to an end soon is because it will take the pressure off of those of us who think we're supposed to be the leader. Good news, God is. Our privilege then is to employ, here it is again, fellowship. Our, our privilege is to hear, to pray, and to follow him. The word disciple, you hear it, it denotes fellowship. Jesus doesn't walk around and say, hey, hey, leave your tax booth and I'm going to make you a good leader. Hey, leave your fishing business. I got a leadership course going on. He says, come and follow me. So we might not eliminate the term leadership during this series. I actually hope we do, but I hope we at least diminish its use and magnify the word fellowship. The goal of this series is to have a church that's leaving, leading, and embracing, following God. With that being said, I can't think of a better person to preach today than uh, Rick Don. Hey, y'all shouldn't be clapping. <laughs> Rick Don. Uh, 
really is my mentor. He was my favorite professor in college a long time ago, 1988. Uh, I won't say when I graduated, but I did graduate. Uh, he was my favorite professor then. He modeled all of this stuff that I'm teaching, discipleship, mentorship, servanthood. He modeled it all. Uh, I could tell you about his church with thousands of people that attend. I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. I could talk about the degrees that he has, undergrad, master's level, doctoral. I'm not going to do that. I could talk about his Tennessee volunteers that spanked, spanked Alabama yesterday. Won't he do it? Won't God move? But I won't talk about that. I could talk about his, his awesome wife, which he probably wouldn't mind, his daughter and his sons. Uh, but I want you to know that what we're talking about in this series, he embodies, he, em he personifies, he's an exemplar of. And so I can't think of a better person to preach today. Would you give him a factory welcome, Rick Dunn? Oh, that you're going to get out of church earlier today than you wanted to do. <laughs> what, a, what a gracious introduction. I was expecting to wear orange and lead in Rocky Top, but we'll let that go. So when I teach, I teach the intersection of me and Jesus, the Word and the Spirit. That's all I got. So I'm not going to teach you today as one who knows. I'm going to teach you today as one who is learning. Disciples are learners, right? But we're going to touch on something. It's pretty tender. It's not easy, but it's necessary. And I feel like I can do that because y'all are my family. Amen. Keith is gracious enough to introduce me today before he goes to see his dad. And I told him, I said, that's great. I love you. I love seeing you and Lucille and Blake. And, um, but it'd been okay if you didn't because I feel at home here, all right? Which means you're going to get me kind of unplugged. Well, overall, fellowship. I spend my life, my days, my hours. You look at my calendar. All I do is coach leaders. Keith described me as his college professor. That's his way of saying, this is an old man we're coming here. <laughs> I got a few years left. And all my years left are invested in leaders, young leaders, old leaders, church leaders, Organizational leaders, business, big business, little business, Christians, non-Christians. And your pastor is telling you the truth. Those names, those celebrities, I've been in the room with them, Keith. I've walked with them, and I could have told you it was going to happen. And yet, I'm just like them. I... I've shared recently, I have a podcast called Life Reframed. I do with this wonderful young woman, Lauren Morgan. And um, I told her, I said, Lauren, I just, we talked about this. I just want to finish well. And I know, let's, can I say it since we're family? I am a baby boomer, white, southern, mega church, evangelical pastor. The chances of me finishing well are bad. <laughs> Like, we don't even start well, much less finish well. So the only thing I've found to protect me from myself and from people's expectations and their conversations and their introductions is this. And I'm going to ask you to do this at the end. I'm going to ask you to pray with me at the end. I'm going to get you there. Because by the end, you're going to need this. I'm just telling you, right? I'm going to pray that you'll join me, and we're going to take our, our head, and we're going to bury it in the chest of our Father. And we're going to listen for the heartbeat. It's a heartbeat of grace. It's a heartbeat of mercy. It is a heartbeat of justice. It is a heartbeat of hope. It is a heartbeat of truth. It is a heartbeat of love. 
And I want you to, I literally want your soul, I'm going to ask the Spirit to let your soul just listen to him breathe. The breath that spoke into being all of creation. The breath that called your name. And I want you to hear on his lips the word, my beloved, my beloved daughter, my beloved son. Because without that love, you won't follow. You're just making it up and add one more religious thing to things you don't get right. So Jesus has been talking to his disciples and explaining some things like he often did towards the end of his life on earth. And he starts telling them, hey, I'm going to die and this is what it's going to look like. And they're just all looking at him like, I, does anybody have any idea what he's talking about? And then it happens, like it happens so often. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, Jesus being perfect, I don't know what he did. I would have been just like, Lord, How many times do we have to talk about this? When I go home this afternoon... All anybody in Knoxville is talking about is all. That's all anybody's talking about because that's what they care about, and it's a big deal, right? Yeah. You know somebody by what they want to tell you about. Well, you know what the disciples want to talk about? Which one of us is going to be the best? Who's going to get the place of honor? Who is, who's going to sit beside you, Jesus? There's two words I want to give to this question. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The first word is selfish. Yeah. Selfish. And the second word is childish. I have grandsons that are seven, three, and one. Pray for my daughter. Pray the Spirit of God will rescue her soul. Pray he'll forgive her for what comes out of her mouth. She texted me last night. And she listed all the things that happened in one day. She said, everybody's going to bed early tonight. Which I'm far because I don't want her to kill them. So... Selfish and childish. This young lady who led worship, did you hear what she said about the storm? Yes. Did you understand what she said about the storm? And that Jesus doesn't fail you? Do you understand you don't know that until you've been through the storm? All right? All right? So let me tell you this, all right? You're not going to understand this Father's heart until your childishness is exposed. Verse 2, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. This is, I love this. Jesus is like, is knuckleheads? i just like, what in the world? I've told him, I've to, I know what I'll do. So he brings, he brings a child into their childish behavior. And he says, truly I tell you, unless you change Everybody understand the word? Here's what the Greek word change means. Change. <laughs> it can't continue to be so. And become like little children. You will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, I could just stop and pray right now. We'd be all right because I ain't said anything better than that, but I'm going to try to walk you through it, and it's not going to feel good for a little while because we need to expose our childishness. Keith, the reason these leaders fall, I watched them, because they pretended they didn't need to be like children. I sat in the room with them, and they pretended they were the man. And there is only one. Verse 4, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. You see, our journey out of childishness begins with childlikeness. I'm going to take you there today, childlikeness. Keith, I planned this sermon before I knew you were in the fellowship series. That means the Spirit of God wanted you to hear this. Not me, him. So let's talk a little bit about childishness. You know what? It's appropriate for a child to be childish. I spent the day with my three-and-a-half-year-old grandson, Abraham, recently. I listed some of the abisms. This is just in one day. These are the things he said. 
Friends are the best of all. Well, no, actually, Dollywood is the best of all. <laughs> you can't drink an Oreo. That's not true. I don't feel loved because my brother James has a desk, and I don't. This one, this is a good proverb. The yuckiest things are the best for your body. <laughs> and I don't know where this came from, but I think it's true. It, you have to learn to be careful if you're going to be a butt doctor. So I don't know. <laughs> like, if I went to one, I'd want to be careful, right? So, you know, it's funny in a three-and-a-half-year-old, but if Abraham at 23 saying things like that, you're like, hmm, I'm missing But let me tell you this, when it comes to mental, emotional, social, relational, and spiritual maturity, age is no guarantee of maturity. And Jesus' remedy for my childishness is childlikeness. He says, he brings a child, he said, Rick, like if you don't understand this, if you can't be like this child, if you can't change and be like this child, Rick, whatever you taste of the kingdom of heaven is going to be tasteless. Whatever you experience in the kingdom of heaven is going to be thin. It's going to be a veneer. It's not going to be real and deep. Childlikeness, if you're taking notes or you want to put this in your brain, childlikeness is where we turn toward the Father for all of life. All of life. And I've left out a word here. When I say our journey of childishness begins with, out of childishness begins with childlikeness, I've got another word I'm going to get to in about 20 minutes. If it was keys, it'd be 40. If me, it's about 20, okay? <laughs> I'm going to get to this word. And when I get to this word, it's going to change everything. But I'm going to hold it for now because I just want you to understand, turning toward the Father for all of life. My, my boys, my seven- and three-year-old, love the pool. And when, when I'm with them at the pool, and it's me and my wife and my daughter and my, my son-in-law, when they're hurt, when they do something spectacular, jump, do a flip, when they need a referee every 30 seconds, when they need boundaries to not do things they think they can do, they can't do. When they need uh, swimmies so they can do some things they want to do, they don't turn to me. They turn to their mom and dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Naturally, Naturally. Instinctively. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Now, if they're not there, they'll turn to me. Yeah. But they're going to turn there. And our spiritual maturity, our authentic spiritual strength comes from being like that child that says, Hey, I'm hurt. Hey, Father, I'm hurt. Hey, Father, I need boundaries. Hey, Father, I, I need protection. Hey, Father, I need a referee. Hey, Father, I need you to protect me from me. Hey, Father, I need you to protect me from them. Hey, Father, I need you. I need you. My own journey of childishness, out of childishness, has been a bit rough. Um, <clears throat> I was, it's about the fall, and, um, and I went through this season, and the Lord started just taking me apart. I went to the chair of the elder board, and I said, hey, I just want you to know I'm not okay. I, I can't, I'm not blaming my wife, my church, or anything. I'm just not, I'm not okay as a husband. I'm not okay as a dad. I'm not okay as a pastor. I'm not okay as, I'm just not okay. So I began to try to sort out what more of that was. And God began to say, hey, I, I, you got some childishness in you. You know, they say in war, when a uh, soldier confronts the enemy and gets afraid, the soldier immediately defaults to how they were trained. Does that make sense to you? The template, right? That, you, that you're going to, well, you know where your template came from your family, yeah, yeah, yeah. and your culture. Yeah. Yeah. And you got some, hopefully most of you, most people got some good things from their family. But we all got some things that are childish. I told my kids, I started out, I used to write stuff on parenting. And then I had my second child, and I quit writing. 
After my first child, I was a, a good dad. After my second child, I was lost. Yeah, Jesus, Lord Jesus. He's doing okay. He's doing okay today. Um, I, I, my parenting really I lowered the bar. At first, I was like, I'm going to be the best parent and have the best kids. And then I'm like, I told my kids, I said, look, I got two things I can offer you. Jesus and a college degree so you can pay for your counseling. That's all I got for you, right? <laughs> So I began to realize that things happening in my life were from the way I had grown up and the way I had engaged the, the template keys. By the way, my church loves keys more than me when it's a teacher. Just, can I just say that? <laughs> Y'all are blessed. Listen to the man. Listen to the man. Okay? I'd actually come and hear you over me, too. That's just straight up. <laughs> But so things start to, like I start seeing my template, to use your word, it's not good. And it's easy for me to look at those people who've fallen because I've watched them fall and be like, thank you, Jesus, I'm not like them. I didn't, that's not going to cut it. Um, so things progressively got worse. I lost, started losing my heart, started losing my voice, not my physical voice, this voice. So I go into January of that year, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty torn apart. I'm pretty taken apart, not torn apart, taken apart. The first thing that happens in January of that year is one of our young women in church, one of the most wonderful, gracious, vibrant people I've ever known and met, Rachel, her, her cancer came back, 37 years old with three little kids. And we're sitting in that hospital room, which became a sanctuary. And it, we saw Jesus show up, Jesus show up, and part of my life, part of my sacred opportunity was to help her die in, he, in her heart, to die from this and transition to the next life, and to know that Jesus would care for her children, which, by the way, I'm about to baptize one of them. Praise you for your faithfulness. <laughs> Rachel died March the 1st, and I'll be honest with you, March the 2nd, I was shot. I'd been through my own journey. I'd been in that hospital room every, almost every day for 30-something days. I'd walked with her father through the loss of his daughter. I mean, it just, I was worn out. March the 2nd, 2020. You with me? I wasn't even starting to be broken apart. So I share with you as one who is learning what it means to be a child and who has been lovingly disciplined for his extensive childishness who when life got hard I reverted to my training template now you ready to move through this we're going to need Jesus but I'm going to give you a vision for maturity because the vision for maturity will help us understand what the need is. And then we're going to turn to Jesus. And then we're going to bear a head in the Father's heart. And he'll do all the work that needs to be done. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I, I thought like a child. I re reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Imagine for me a world where men and women put the ways of childhood behind them. Because if 2020 through 2022 taught us anything, we got some childishness. American church got some childishness. Our, I, look, I'll tell you the truth. I, I, I hadn't been to Georgia for a while, but just watching the game yesterday, y'all's politics is nasty. It's nasty everywhere, but Georgia, because there's so much on the line, right? It's just, whoo, childish. That's not our problem. People running around just deciding what they want, what they do, and mad if you don't let them do it. It's not a problem. A culture that is just so all about power and wealth 
and uh, consumption. It's not our problem. Our problem is the people of God are childish and don't offer an alternative. Yeah. Including me. It's in me too. I need Jesus. I want to become that mature person. In Ephesians chapter 4, a passage all about disciple making, Paul gives us a, a vision for this idea of moving out of childishness. He says in, in 4.14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. When I go before Jesus, he will not ask me a question about my resume. He won't critique my teaching. He won't evaluate uh, my possessions. You know what he'll do? He said, hey, I entrusted you to be a pastor. Did you lead people to maturity? By maturing? Because that's actually what I ask you to do. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge in the Son of God, and become what? Mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Fellowship. It's not just a cute word. It's not just this idea Keith thought of because he wanted another hat. <laughs> Although you look good in it. You look good. <laughs> He's always looking good. That's just something I know. He's always looking good. Fellowship is the path to maturity. Yeah, right. But people aren't avoiding the path because they think it's necessarily a bad idea. They're avoiding the path because everybody by nature resist maturity. It's in ourselves because our forefathers and foremothers, specifically Adam and Eve, chose to act childish instead of childlike. They got tricked into childishness. So here's some things this passage gives us. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but I think they're worth thinking about in our lives. What does maturity look like? Well, <clears throat> Maturity always looks like adult responsibility taking. Now, yeah, I can tell you the difference in somebody's mature or not, but when they take responsibility to own and steward their own lives, or if they're blaming everybody else, or looking for somebody else to take care of them. My seven, three, and one year old grandsons, they need to be taken care of. My 25 and 27 year old sons, they off the payroll. The benefits have been terminated. I love them. I once spoke to a group of young adults about anxiety, and I said, you know, you may not think of this, but your parents have anxiety. So I talked about what it's like to raise uh, young adult children. Here's the description. No, no, no offense to uh, Blake or any young adults in here, okay? My favorite people in the world. But this is what parents do, and, and we have to learn not to do this. This is about parents, not about young adults. If you want to... to uh, get your young adult child to get do what you want to do? Let me suggest something for you. Grab your remote control. Go to your neighbor's house five houses away and try to change the channel. And when your thumb wears out or your battery's dead, you'll understand what it's like parenting a young adult. Because... They've got to adult, and they've got to take responsibility for their lives, and so you got to let them do it. I don't like it. I can come home, but I don't like it. I like, I like being in control. Then, then these young adults, they said, hey, what, um, how can we help our parents with their stress? I said, get a job. That's like, that's it. Woo. Set us free. My church, 
it's more young adults than it has people my age. So understand, I love and value young adults. But everything in the culture is telling them not to adult. Is the church modeling what an adult looks like that they'd want to be? Our culture uh, not only tolerates, it celebrates immaturity. So when people are in pain and life is hard, is what you, when you get to see where your maturity is, people in pain and life is hard, our culture says either passively retreat, reactively attack, or get your addiction on. So, and what happens is we just stay immature. My addiction is comfort. I'm 61 years old. I get cold really quickly. I get tired. My joints hurt. I have nothing in my house that's alive except me and my wife to take care of. When I go home this afternoon, it's about me. And I'm sure she's looking forward to getting that tired, achy old man back, right? <laughs> We've got to take responsibility in the church to be God's people and in our work and our relationships. And we've got to help each other because we all sometimes get afraid and go back to that childishness. And what you do in childishness is different than what I do, but we need each other. Here's another sign of maturity this passage gives us is relationships formed by truth in love. That means when we're in conflict, we don't mask the truth and we don't abandon love. And if we don't do hard, if you say, I'm not doing hard, which, by the way, 2020, 2022, some people just say, I'm not doing hard. I'm done. I'm pretty much, you know, church is hard. I'm not doing hard. If you don't do hard, your relationships weaken, your heart atrophies. You know how a muscle loses it? Your heart atrophies and your soul grows small. We have to speak the truth in love. We have to learn to do that. Those of you who are truth sayers, you've got to learn to have some compassion. here. And those of you who are all compassionate, you've got to learn to step into the truth. Together. Here's another thing that we find. Generosity. As every part does its work to grow the whole body up. It's not just about your journey. Maturity is about being generous, but we're not inclined to that. We're inclined to make it all about us, just like the disciples. I'm no more different than they are. Followship is going to mean you're going to have to let go of it being all about you. It's, I mean, when I was little, like, so when I was little, I have a, I'm an only child. My cousin was an only child. We were the only, he's the only cousin I ever had any relationship with. So we were pretty close. And our grandmother both got us a baby ducks for Easter. Only a southern grandmother would get, a, you know what I'm saying, like a duck. What am I going to do with that duck? I know my mom and dad are just shaking their head. What am I going to do? So we got two ducks, duck for Robbie, duck for me. We were spending the weekend at, at grandma's house. They're, they're ducks, and you know, they're both ducks. I mean, they're yellow, and they've got fuzzy faces and beaks and feet. And we woke up the next morning. One of the ducks had died. I told my grandma, I'm so sad Robbie's duck died. You know what I'm saying. Mind my me, mind my me, mind my me. You gotta understand that when they're three and four. Twenty-three, thirty-four, forty-four. We need to be stepping out of that. Church isn't about you, it's about Jesus. Your life isn't yours, you've been bought with a price. That person sitting next to you that drives you crazy, well you drive them crazy too. And you can ask them if you don't believe it, so <laughs> not that. All right. Here's another thing we find. I've got just a couple more of these. I won't go on all day, but they're important. Fullness and grace and truth. We talk about, there's a, there's a, we like enter into, we think of here's grace and here's truth and let's balance them, right? 50 grace, 50. Ain't 50 grace, 50 truth. It's 100 grace, 100 truth. You can't separate it in Jesus. We can't imagine they're actually the same thing. They're the heart and character of who God is. We've got to learn how to do that. It's, 
It's not easy in marriage, I'll tell you that. Now, for those of y'all who keep up with these things, my wife is what's called an eight on the Enneagram. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is means she is on the move, straight at you, telling you the truth every moment. She's also an external processor. We will celebrate our 40th anniversary in May. Amen. Amen. 40 years, and I've never said, how do you feel? <laughs> the whole world knows how my wife feels. <laughs> we, just, we just did a teaching on marriage at our church, and, and uh, they used the video clip of her because she's, she's the one you want to hear. She's amazing. And so they use this video clip of her, and, and in it, her eyes are big, and she's just being so adamant. And she said, are, are my eyes like that? I'm like, what? Do you know how little sleep I've gotten because of those eyes? <laughs> I'm, a nine, I'm a nine, which on the Enneagram, is the, it's a personality style. It's in, I'm empathic. I, I listen first. I don't come towards you. I kind of allow a lot of space around me. The scriptures say, don't let, your son, don't let the sun go down your anger. My wife should let me have it. 10.35 p.m. <laughs> then she rolls over and goes to sleep. Sun not going down on her anger. I'm sitting like this the rest of the night. 4 a.m., I'm thinking, good grief, do I need to get an attorney? What are we going to do here? So. You know, the church is priceless to Jesus. He loved her and gave himself up for her. And millions of Christians in America treated his bride as expendable during COVID. Wouldn't do the work. Wouldn't sit. With, I mean, I remember one guy, he was so mad at me, and he was like, he, we were not on the same page. But he sent me an email of respect and question. I said, let's meet together. And we left that meeting still not in agreement. But I felt loved. And he felt loved. He didn't come back to my church for a long time because he just couldn't agree with me. That's okay. But he came back when it was time. And he had a conversation of grace and truth with me. Okay, a couple more. We'll be here all day. A couple more. We can't be here all day. Here's one. If Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. One of the signs of maturity is a discernment of the good and righteous way. It's a confusing world out there. And anybody who gives you simple reductionistic answers, whether it's because they want to get elected or because they want your money or because they want you to like them, is not telling you the truth. There are no simple answers. There's a need for deep discernment, mature discernment. Where would you go for it? We should be able to come to the people of God who are learning together to train these senses by following. One more. Ecclesiastes 7, 8. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Mm. I'm a writer. I'm a leader. I'm a husband. I'm a father. Finishing is so much harder than starting. Finishing well in all those areas is so much harder than it was to get started. I had great ideas. I knew what I was doing. I thought I was right. And then I get, oh my gosh, this is going to cost, going to hurt. James 1.4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Did you hear that? Perseverance. You're going to have to endure if you want to be mature. Endure to become mature. Always. It's hard. This is just hard work. I've sat with pastors all over the country. I mentor pastors all over the country. I cannot tell you how many of them, not your pastor, but how many of them I've had to talk off the ledge of quitting. They're just tired. And I'm sure you're tired too. And when I see another election cycle coming, I just like, <sighs> but we endure to mature. And it requires a deep investment. 
You see, as I have said, our journey of childishness begin out of our journey out of childishness begins with childlikeness. I've given you a vision from Scripture of what maturity looks like. The journey there is Jesus is only achieved, only found by becoming childlike. And I left out a word, and I want to add a word now to close this out here in a moment. Let me say this, though. Working harder won't get it done. That's religion. And religious working harder is why all the religious empires built between like 1960 and 2020 are falling apart. Hard work by gifted people typically with lots of money, building an empire and then saying, yeah, well, God did it. While secretly in their heart would tell you, but he needed me. Now, we have to endure. That's hard work, but it's not this kind. Like, here's the deal. I, I, I extra, I've got this thing called a whoop. It's, my, it's like a Fitbit on steroids. Every day it tells me, you're not doing enough. I'm beating it right now, though. I told you before, every time it sets the bar, I'm like, I got you. I take you. I, I raise you a level, right? So I'm all about hard work. But if I do all the hard, and I do work out hard, if I do that hard work, and then I go to grab me six cheese crystals and a Chick-fil-A chocolate shake, <laughs> things are going to break down. So it, it matters what's the source of your hard work and endurance. Is it like we sang, the rock? that we build our lives upon? Is it his spirit that fuels us? Or are we using junk food? Whatever it might be, even if it's got a religious name on it, it's just junk food. Junk food for the soul. The word, the spirit, and the body are the nourishment. Look at these passages. First of all, from uh, Matthew 4. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus endured 40 days in that wilderness. He went without food. He went without... By the time it was over, the angels had to come and pick him up off of the ground. He was so depleted, the angels had to pick him up off the ground. Right? And what did he do the whole time when Satan came in and said, Hey, you know, you could get out of this. Jesus says, That would be childish. I'm childlike. I follow the Father. You with me? Do you know who is the most perfectly childlike human being ever? The King of Glory. Because he always said to the Father. Luke 6, he had a chance to, I mean, build a crowd. They were like, give us food, give us miracles. We are yours. We're going to fill a stadium for you, Jesus. And one of these days, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And then he came off that mountain, and he fulfilled the mission. Because he got it from the Father. In childlikeness, he says, I am the Son of God, and I only do the Father's will. So you're not without, Keith and I are not your best examples of mature child likeness. We're on the way. I think we're far enough along that we have credibility and integrity in what we do. I respect Keith. I'm confident in him. I'm so confident in him. And yet he's not my model. And I am a mentor, but I'm not your model. Jesus is your model. And all Jesus ever did was go to the Father. Look at this, John 17, 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may, be, may glorify you. And again, by the end, he's so depleted. He's sweat drops of blood. It's been so hard. There's nothing left of him. And the angels have to come and pick him up off the ground because the father knows he needs it. In the wilderness, before the mission starts, he comes to the end of himself and presses into the Father. In the garden, before the final horrific end of the mission is achieved, he comes to the end of himself and leans into the Father. Not my will, your will be done. 
You see, here's the thing. Our journey out of childishness begins with Christ-like child-likeness. You are never more mature than when you're leaning into the Father. And you're never more immature than when you manufacture a false maturity apart from him. So if you don't like how the world is heading, change and be like a child. You know, I said that when people are afraid, they revert to their training, to their old template. Do you know why they do that? Because they don't know what to do. And they don't know how to survive, and they feel like, like they're, they're about to get killed, or they're about to get overwhelmed, or get taken out, they're about to fail. That was my thing, God had to tell me. You're so... You cannot get past yourself of thinking one day you're going to fail. You can't. I couldn't build a resume big enough to convince myself that I wasn't going to fail. And I realized the harder I worked to finish well, the less likely I was going to finish well. So he took me apart. And you know what he said? Perfect love casts out fear. I have never in my life been more resolute about Jesus and his kingdom. I have never been more resolute about the church because I've heard his heartbeat. Because I've felt his breath. And I've heard him not just call me beloved, but you. And the person sitting beside you. He says, you know, if you'll come to me, you'll come to me. I'll cast out that fear. And I'll teach you how to rest. And how to work hard from a place of rest. How to mature from a place of childlikeness. I'll teach you if you link to me, as Keith says. If you connect to me. You know, when I get to heaven, there's lots of people I'd like to see. Obviously, Jesus, the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Peter, I'm just telling you, you know who I most want to see besides Jesus is his mom, Mary. Because that little girl, that little girl stood between childhood and womanhood and lived in childlikeness and bore the Savior into the world. That little girl is a powerful woman. What would it be like if we became the church that bore the Savior into the world? By childlikeness. Let's pray. You, you spend time with your father however you do. But in my world, I'm imagining him sitting right behind me. And, I, and I'm going to, in my heart, I'm going to go crawl up in his lap. And I'm going to tell him some things I'm afraid of. And we're going to talk about some of my childish that I'm so childishness that I'm so ashamed of. And I'm just going to put my head on his chest and listen like a child. Let go of the fear. That thing you feel threatened by is not a threat. It's a gift for you to sink your head deeper into his chest. That failure, that immaturity that you felt ashamed of when I talked today is your invitation to the throne of grace by which you will receive mercy and a Savior who will say, I get it. I felt that temptation. Now lean into my strength. We were all destined for greatness. The greatness of being a daughter or son 
of the eternal king. That's our greatness. That's our identity. That's all that matters. Let us not forfeit, neglect, or despise the beauty and the power of being like a child. Father, have your way with us. Your word is true. Your spirit guides us into truth. And all I've tried to do is just put up a couple of signposts to to point in that direction. You do the work. It's your work. And we will surrender to that work. To the praise of your glorious grace, we pray. Amen. Thank you all again for the privilege of being with you. Don't let them give you a hard time, Keith. I took 43, right? So it's all good. Um, So I do a podcast. I mentioned earlier with my partner, Lauren Morgan, and we do that every week. We've been doing it since uh, March of 2020, actually. Uh, And so I always have a podcast for every teaching I do. This one, uh, I think it's episode 39 of uh, this 2022, and we talk about childishness and childlikeness. So if you're into podcasts, you want to listen to us talk about that a little bit more personally and in-depth, you're welcome to go there. You can find it on Apple Podcast, any platform that you want. It's less important that you do that and more important that you listen to the Spirit. But if that will be a help to you, um, we would invite you to do that and uh, be on that journey with us as we reframe all of life around the big story of Jesus. So thank you all. Let's just keep leaning into the the heart of God. That's one of the things that I'll take from this. Just keep leaning into him. We will be starting another series in in two weeks. And uh, I will be ending this series next week. And I'll just tell you, I am talking about one who didn't do any of this well. We will end in the book of Isaiah next week talking about Lucifer. He didn't do any of this well. Uh, And we don't want to, I don't know any other way to say it, be like him, unaware. So uh, I'm sorry that I'm not sending you out of here on a high note, but uh, go in peace. Or maybe, maybe go thinking. But go. (laughs) 